The chaotic nature of the Abyss is not one that many can survive, but the demons and creatures who survive in the Abyss not only survive, but thrive. Some of the most powerful creatures in existence in the D&D universe. One such demon lord is the Lord of Undeath, Orcus. From his humble beginnings as a mortal to his ultimate ascent as the Prince of the Undead, Orcus has left a path of devastation in his wake. Throughout the additions of Dungeons and Dragons, Orcus has been transformed, but one thing remains constant, his immense power, an insatiable thirst for destruction. Today, we'll unravel the dark and twisted history of Orcus, exploring his origins, evolution, downfalls, and the many facets of his chaotic realm in the Abyss. So join me as we unlock the mysteries of Orcus and discover the true essence of this enigmatic figure. We start in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, most likely the most powerful and strongest of all demons. If he so much as slaps with his open hand, the blow causes 1 to 4 hit points of damage. His terrible fists can deliver blows of 3 to 13 hit points, and if he uses a weapon, he strikes with a bonus of plus 6. So he can smack you around a little bit if he wants to. He even has a poisonous tail and many magical abilities. Being able to cast things like Feeble Mind, Time Stop, Wish, and Resurrection and any number of summoning spells where he can cast 4 to 48 skeletons or up to 32 zombies at a time. Finally, Orcus holds the Wand of Death, Orcus's Wand, which is a rod of obsidian topped by a skull. This instrument causes instant death or annihilation to any creature, save those of like status, other princes, devils, saints, gods, by merely touching them. Getting to his description, Orcus is a grossly fat demon lord, around 15 feet tall. His huge grey body is covered with goatish hair, and his head is goat-like, although his horns are similar to those of a ram. His great legs are also goat-like, but his arms are humans, with vast bat wings sprouting from his back, and his long, snaky tail tipped with its poisonous head. All of this makes for an extremely deadly creature. Some of the first appearances we see of Orcus are in the Bloodstone Adventures in the Dungeons and Dragons. Orcus is the final goal, as the adventurers are trying to stop him. Orcus's goals are simple yet complex. He hopes to open a gate into the material plane. Through it, Orcus could claim the plane for himself, bringing his hordes and armies of undead. Obviously, the players want to stop this and they delve into the abyss in order to meet him. This adventure is recommended from character levels 18 to 100, so you already know that you're dealing with a very serious adventuring party if you take on this quest. We don't get much about Orcus besides that he's been at war with Demogorgon and Grazd for thousands of centuries. Orcus's home is the 333rd layer of the Abyss, Thanatos. Mostly what is known of this layer is, is a labyrinthian mountain that surrounds the palace of Orcus. In this module, the heroes hope to steal the wand of Orcus from him. And in the end, regardless of their method, they do. Orcus will definitely survive any encounter with the players and destroy them if he wants to. Even very high-level PCs who give Orcus a difficult and interesting fight, he will end up retreating. And by one way or another, the adventurers of this story find the wand and bring it to Bahamut to have it destroyed. Though just as soon as they destroy it, it is revealed Orcus will rebuild the wand, and pretty easily. At most, it would take a full century for Orcus to build the wand, which in their time is almost no time. His power is somewhat lessened, but Orcus has a long memory, hordes of demons, and still a lot of magic at his disposal, and the descendants of those heroes may be the targets of his wrath. And so, in first edition, we just really get a glimpse of the power Orcus has, some of his goals, and his position in the Abyss. In second edition, Orcus, like many of the fiends, demons, and devils alike, were excluded from many initial books. We get a more defined history to what happened in first edition. It is said that there was a man named Celadon who was part of the initial party who stole the Wand of Orcus and delivered it to the Seven Heavens for its destruction. From there, Bahamut the Platinum Dragon planted a gem that grew into a beautiful white tree to forever banish Orcus and the other monsters of the Abyss from the Bloodstone lands where they were trying to invade. But if you look for Orcus throughout the rest of 2nd edition, you might be disappointed. There's not much about him, although there is a small passage that mentions him. 
Orcus, a major Tanari lord, the leader of the undead armies and the eternal foe of Demogorgon, is disposed, or slain, by the drow goddess Kyrian Sali. His body is cast into the astral plane, his wand locked away in Agathian, the fourth layer of Pandemonium. This upheaval deals a major blow to the Tanari armies, who had come to count on Orcus as undead, but some Tanari high ups look for ways to restore Orcus to power. And so what is essentially a footnote in another story, we find out about the death of Orcus, disrespecting one of the most powerful demon lords. It is revealed that he grew lazy and complacent in his wars, and that is the reason he was so easily killed. Yet Orcus's story is far from over. For those Tanari who look to restore his power are successful, and it is not Orcus you must look for in 2nd edition, but Tenebris, a shadow of Orcus. An undead godling was shut off from the light of life. What's more, he'd lost too much strength to hold on to his former level of divinity, lesser than even a demi-power. He could no longer form avatars. But make no mistake, he was far beyond the strength of the mightiest mortal, and still in command of potent and terrible might. He hungered to exact revenge on those who'd wronged him. And so much time passed, with Tenebris and his followers secretly searching in the multiverse. And one day, the undead Tenebris found the last word. The ultimate magic of unmaking. A force potent enough to slay even a god. But Orcus still lacked one very important thing. Something to make him whole again. Something to make Tenebris into Orcus his wand. Which brings us to the plain of Mechanus, where in the central chamber of the great Modron Cathedral sat the one in the prime, Primus, ruler of Mechanus, knower of all. Though even he was surprised when Tenebris approached him, inquiring about his wand. But before Primus could call for help, Tenebris spoke the last word. And Primus, the one in the prime, died instantly. And so Tenebris became Primus for a time, leading all of the Modrons on a great march across the multiverse in search of his wand. In the end, Primus was able to find his wand with the help of the Modrons. Though he was forever changed, he began to think more lawful for the first time, obsessed with the perfect structure of Mechanus, and he even started to have regret in his life. Though he knew there was much to be done, much to learn, and much to gain. There were still many obstacles in his way, obstacles that others would consider insurmountable, and he doubted that Primus would be the last god he would have to kill. In 3rd edition we get the return of Orcus. It is not clear how or why, but the truth can no longer be denied. Orcus is back with a vengeance. Was the demon lord ever really dead? Probably which accounts for his long absence and explains his recent incarnation as a power of death, calling himself Tenebris. As Tenebris, Orcus was able to slay even deities, wielding an ancient power known as the Last Word, he bullied some and slew others. And with its strength initiated a spell of resurrection cast by one of his last faithful servants, the half-ogre, Guanomag. Heroes from the Material Plane seemingly disrupted this ceremony at the 11th hour, but Orcus returned all the same. Despite the fact that the power of the last word is dissipated, Orcus is a cruel, heartless, and powerful demon lord in his own right. Neretir and the abyssal layer of Thanatos on which it resides is rightfully his, and he will have it no matter what. Let his enemies despair. And so in 3rd edition, Orcus makes his glorious return, spending a couple thousands years dead and a shadow of himself. The drow deity who slew him and inhabited Thanatos for a time has mysteriously disappeared, and no one knows whether she fled or was slain. And from speculation, it is pretty much guaranteed that Orcus has taken a very swift vengeance on those who had wronged him, and he is seated at his rightful place. But he has not forgotten his mistakes. He is no longer content to grow old and fat feeding on larvae in his castle. He focuses his anger and hate on the absolute destruction of his enemies and the spread of woe and havoc among mortals. Truly a demon reborn, Orcus is more terrible and more dangerous than ever. Orcus hates both Demogorgon and Grazd. He resents them for their power and he covets their realms. 
Orcus commands a host of undead as well as armies of demons that ravage the fields of the abyss that they cross. One of Orcus' most chief powers are those who worship him, probably because he has an identifiable if loathsome portfolio, Orcus is worshipped as a god more often than most of the other demon princes are. Orcus might be the closest to ascending to true godhood among all of them. Orcus is in many ways a contradictory figure. He does not delight in his charges, the undead, and has not taken up the self-proclaimed mantle Prince of the Undead out of devotion or allegiance. If anything, the demon lord despises undead. He is little but contempt for them and uses them without thought or consideration. Of course, Orcus despises the living as well. He hates all things and sees with utter revulsion and loathing at all times. He craves only personal power in the spread of misery and destruction for all others. Occasionally, Orcus allows his wand to be found by a mortal in order to wreak greater chaos and evil among those inhabiting the material plane. This sort of dalliance lasts only for a short time perhaps a year or two, before the bloated prince glows bored and reclaims his artifact, usually along with the soul of whoever carries it. What's even more impactful is the Cult of Orcus, a widespread, significant following among humanoids, in particular orcs, half-orcs, ogres, and giants. He has many temples where he demands living sacrifice as part of his rituals. Blood and skulls are an important part of the imagery used in his worship, Intelligent undead never willingly serve him. However, many vampires, liches, and other undead creatures are forced into his service by dark packs or compelling magic. You also get more information about the one who brought him back, an unusual human named Kwa Nomag, whose ancestry includes an ogre. He's a despicable creature in virtually every way. The evil cleric used an obscene ritual on the astral plane that restored Orcus and Orcus did reward him with many blessings. Although the Prince of the Undead already tires of Quanomag's self-importance and arrogance, and so Orcus is in a unique position where among demons, his presence on the material plane is most known, which gives him power in the wars against Demogorgon and Grazd. In 3rd edition, we also get more information about Orcus' life before being a demon lord. Orcus began life thousands of years ago as a wicked mortal, whose vile deeds eventually resulted in his death. Thereafter, his soul manifested upon the abyss as a larva, then a mane. In that form, he toiled long centuries under the lashes of now-forgotten demon lords, eventually managing through sheer will to evolve into a Rutterkin. The Demononomicon of Igwil suggests that Orcus next became a Nelfeshni, and that he sat upon the 400th layer's court of woe during the era of the Githyanki revolt against the Illithid Empire. Eventually, Orcus conquered the 113th layer and became a demon lord with the appearance he retains to this day. That 113th layer he conquered is known as Thanatos, where daylight never intrudes. The melancholic moon changes phases at random when covered by clouds, making time difficult to measure. All living mortals on Thanatos take damage per round, and mortals that die upon Thanatos rise as undead. Again, we get more insight into Orcus's mind, as he has no particularly affinity for the undead, seeing them as useful tools in the constant struggle for more and more power. This pursuit has defined his entire existence and fuels his hatred of rivals of those whom he pursues as failures and traitors. And so, as we learn more of his past, we get a glimpse into his future. On his way to godhood, he has surpassed all demons except for maybe Demogorgon, though undoubtedly he is closer to godhood than him. And if a demon lord such as Orcus became a god, it could mean the end of all other life, if that's what he desired. Fourth edition flips the script on us a bit as it usually does. It states that when the Abyss was birthed, it transformed some of the mighty primordials, Demogorgon, Baphomet, and Orcus. And so at this point, we are not sure if Orcus was a primordial or rose into power as a demon lord. Regardless, we do get Orcus's vision of the future and into some channels about how he seeks to grow his power. He looks to the Shadowfell and therefore the Raven Queen. He had become obsessed with the Raven Queen and her control over death. His hatred comes to the forefront in adventures. Orcus and his cults 
seek to propel him into godhood by killing the Raven Queen and stealing hers. Orcus intends to usurp the powers and privileges of the Raven Queen, the god of death, fate, and winter. If he accomplishes his aim, no soul shall rest easy again. In the end, Orcus and his allies are chased off by the brave adventurers. Though we do get a glimpse into what could have been, if the adventurers fail, we see just how close Orcus is to total domination. Orcus ushers in a terrible era. Rather than sending souls to their final fate with the Raven Queen, Orcus hoards them as animate undead in an army of ever-swelling numbers. If allowed to continue, the number of dead soon outnumber the living, and Orcus moves forward with his vast force to become the most powerful divine being in the multiverse. And finally, 5th edition. Orcus, demon prince of undeath and the blood lord, worshipped by undead and by living creatures that channel their power. A brooding and nihilistic entity, Orcus yearns to make the multiverse a place of death and darkness, forever unchanging except by his will. We do get an insight into all of the things in the universe that you may know that Orcus has had a hand in. He is controlled and worshipped by liches. All liches pay homage to Orcus, and it is said that Orcus can instantly destroy the phylactery of any lich that displeases him. He's also responsible for Death Knights, Bodax, Devourers, and Spawn of Caiuses. And Orcus becomes less of a big bad evil guy seeking destruction for destruction's sake, as we get a glimpse inside. All he wants, in the end, is to see the end of all life in the cosmos. Replace the living with immortal, undead creatures that answer only to him. And in this grim future, the many sons of the material plane are extinguished, and all hope has faded away. All that remains is the eternally static realm of the living dead. Orcus is the universe's staunchest advocate of stagnation. He sees the activity of life as noisy, crude, and maddening. It rakes at his senses like the claws of a rat scratch across a hard floor. And from his view, the universe can only know peace when life's incessant hum is replaced with the peace and quiet of the world of the dead. Which, all things considered, is pretty reasonable as far as demons go. At least he has a cause for wanting to see the end of the world. His cultists and worshippers are heretics and blasphemers who see the gods of the multiverse as cruel, unjust creatures. They resent that mortals must suffer and die at the whims of these entities. In Orcus, they see the promise of release from pain without the demand of obedience. In the state of undeath that Orcus offers, they will be free from hunger, fear, or worry. People who have lost a loved one to a tragic death are especially susceptible to his appeal. A father stricken with grief after the death of his child might seek Orcus's intervention in returning his child to the world after the gods cruelly snatched her away. All who become cultists of Orcus must be willing to become undead. Those who commit to the cause are admitted to the cult. And Orcus's story is at an all-time climax as he is poised to take over the Prime Material. Except we aren't done, because 5th edition has a module called Out of the Abyss. One that you expect to heavily feature Orcus, one of the chiefest demons of the Abyss. And we find him in a battle against his greatest foe, Demogorgon. The sounds of battle finally die away, the ground before you stained black and red with demonic blood and ichor. In the terrible grip of Demogorgon, even the mighty Orcus looks almost small. Tentacles hold the demon prince of undeath in a crushing grip, slithering across the maggot-riddled flesh of the horned demon as they tighten inexorably. A strangled gasp issues from the demon lord's throat, as a horrific crunching sound echoes throughout the cavern, and his skull-topped wand clatters onto the floor. Demogorgon casts aside the limp form which melts away as Orcus returns to the abyss that spawned him. The Prince of Demon throws back his two heads and roars his triumph. As he does, his nearer head turns, burning eyes raking across the battlefield, filled with bloodlust and battle rage. The Demon Lord searches for another target. Okay, so 5th edition did feature Orcus heavily in Into the Abyss, but is essentially a video game cutscene before the real battle, just to show you the power of Demogorg, which is disappointing. But, even though he died in this fight, he returns to the Abyss, as he cannot be taken out that easily. And so, with Demogorgon moved back to the top of his list, we leave Orcus off. 
his cults and followers on the material the strongest. His will, resolve, power some of the greatest in all of the abyss, and equipped with the knowledge of what happens. When you fail, you can never count on this out. And as the world of D&D becomes even more dangerous, many will look to Orcus to see his eternal dream realized, the realm of the living dead, putting an end to the noisy, crude, maddening chaos of life. And if he ever achieves godhood throughout one of his many routes there, we would surely know the peace when life's incessant hum is replaced with the peace and quiet of the world of the dead.